Well, hello there, and welcome to Dome at Home. We were having a little bit of an audio glitch there, but I hope we're getting back to uh, everything working properly here. Welcome to the show. My name is Scott Young, and I'm your host, the Planetarium Astronomer in at the Manitoba Museum. And uh, yeah, it looks like things are slowly starting to come together here. Audio is back on, and uh, now we have everything running, I think, which is great. Nice to see so many people popping into the chat to uh, say hello. Do tell us where you're watching from, and uh, we always love to see what's going on in the sky um, and share it with all the people across the province. Uh, okay, excellent. I'm glad that uh, this seems to be working out. We have a pretty good show for you lined up tonight. Lots of great mail, which has been nice. We'll uh, show some of, uh, some of the viewer images that have been coming in, talk about some of the stories that uh, people have sent in. And then we will jump into our main feature, I would say, which is really all about the inner planets. The inner planets are one of those um, sort of categories that we'll use to figure out the solar system. You know, we got to kind of categorize things, put them into boxes and things like that. It's a little bit, well, it's not as vague as some of the other definitions of planet. So it is kind of nice to have uh, something that is relatively simple. Basically, the inner planets are everything inside the asteroid belt and closer to the sun. So that's basically the inner solar system. We're going to be talking about the big stuff there. Um, all right, lots of folks checking in. Very, very nice to see everyone. We got uh, Hollis from down in, uh, down in Connecticut. Uh, Crystal City, Cassidy, nice to, nice to see you. Callie from Swan River, always great to see you, Vivian. And, and uh, everybody here, this is, uh, this is really nice. All right, oh, hi, Randy, and Val, and Brad, and I feel like, how many of you are old enough to remember the, the TV show Romper Room? You remember Romper Room, where at the end they would hold up this magic mirror and they would, they would name all these kids, and, and I see you too? They never ever named me that I recall, so I was always disappointed. So I think that's why I call out so many people here, just, you know, just in case you had the same traumatic experience with Romper Room as well and didn't get your name called. So, all right, let's uh, dive into our show here. We're going to be talking about the inner planets but before we get to that, let's uh, do our, our news and mail. So, uh, as you know, this show is produced by the Manitoba Museum, which is here in Winnipeg, Manitoba, in Treaty 1 territory. And we have some really big news. The museum is reopening. In fact, it reopened today. We've been closed for many months for COVID. Um, we finally have the go-ahead to open under limited circumstances. We have limited hours. We have... Um, the number of people reduced, of course, we have masks and vaccination protocols and all those kinds of things in place to make it as safe as possible. And so the gallery is open today and the planetarium will reopen on Saturday. And uh, people who've been watching the show regularly will remember that we had a new planetarium show ready to open and then we had to sort of shut it all down. The new show Magic Globe will be opening on Saturday. It runs twice during the day and the regular um, Planetarium Sky Tour, Manitoba Skies, also runs twice. So you can go and check out both of those shows. Magic Globe is actually really cool. I mean, it's sort of done in a cartoon style, but it's not really just for little kids. It's, it's got some good content in it. It's about the, you know, our place in space and, and how it fits in with the seasons and all, those, all the cycles of the sky. Really well produced, really well um, acted and written and so on. It's, so it's... It, this picture looks kind of cartoony, but it's actually a really, really good show. I would sit through it and, and watch it several times in a row. In fact, I'm sure I will be sitting through the show many, many, many times. So that's the mark of a good planetarium show. If you can see it a hundred times in a row and not go insane, it's a great show. So I'm looking forward to seeing how uh, how this one stands up, but it, it really is a fun program. So come and check that out. And we will also be having um, our good friend Mike on in a future show to talk about some other upcoming new planetarium programs that we can't quite announce yet, but we are getting ready to, uh, to share with the world. So that's pretty exciting. All right, let's get to your images. Um, the last week, well, here in southern Manitoba, if you're not here, it's cold. Extreme cold warnings extreme wind chill warnings, blizzard warnings. It's like the worst 
of the worst of winter. A um, friend of mine, Ashley, up in Churchill was shooting the aurora last night and the wind chill topped out at minus 57 degrees Celsius. So that's pretty crazy. Having said that, it has brought us some clear skies and we've had some lovely mornings, particularly with Venus and the moon uh, rising in the, in the morning just a, a few days ago, sort of beside each other. It was a beautiful shot. This is uh, from regular viewer Ulrich, who has, uh, who has captured this image. And then just a few days later, I guess yesterday, they captured this nice close-up of the moon and Jupiter as they were over in the evening sky. Nice thin crescent, beautiful view of the earth shine there that the, uh, the dark side of the moon is partly lit up because even though there's no sun shining on it, there is light reflecting off the planet Earth and back out to the moon and sort of filling in that shadow a little bit. Kind of like a photographer would hold up a, a white piece of cardboard to, to fill in shadows or something like that. Essentially, that's what's happening, and it's our planet that's doing that job. Beautiful, beautiful view, and uh, great images, Ulrich. Thanks for, uh, thanks for sharing. We got a, an image from Jenny Gates as well. This is Venus in the morning sky, and it was kind of interesting because I kind of assumed that Jenny had watched the show and so sent in one of her images. But she actually hadn't heard about the show. She just sent it into the planetarium and, and was asking which, which star it was. So I, you know, I replied. We, we went back and forth a little bit. And something that was kind of interesting, they shot this from inside. And so there's actually, uh, to the upper left of Venus, there's a little reflection, which is actually because of the multiple panes of glass in the, in the um, window. If you're observing from inside, you will sometimes get these sort of multiple reflections. Often we get UFO videos sent to us that are exactly this, where there's a light and then a reflection that seems to move around as the camera moves and things like that. So it was just a great opportunity not only to, to showcase the nice Venus image there, but also to show that reflection. Here's the, uh, the same image with uh, just a little Photoshop magic just to remove that. And uh, a great, great thing. Uh, image there. Thanks, Jenny, for letting me uh, letting me share that. We also got some uh, great video and images from uh, Yes. Beautiful pillars. also a still here that we can uh, take a look at. These light pillars, um, are, like I say, are often confused for northern lights, but they aren't the same kind of phenomenon at all. This is caused by light down here on the earth, and it's caused by ice crystals that are way up in the atmosphere, well, all over in the atmosphere. Mm. Oh, okay. We lost, okay, we had a little audio. You know what? I bet my microphone just didn't transfer through with the video. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so the uh, the video was basically showing the the light pillars um, and a, a, a really nice panoramic view. With this cold weather, it really is perfect for making these light pillars. And so it turns out that what's happening is you're getting these ice crystals that are shaped like hexagons, and they're very, very flat. They're almost like like dinner plates or CDs or something like that. And as they float in the air, they sort of stay level, kind of like, you know, because um, the air is, is dense enough to make them float kind of like a feather. They don't go on one end and go straight down. They just sort of float there. And because of that, you've got all these reflective ice crystals so that light on the ground down on the left here can go up into the sky and then bounce back down to us. And depending on how far away the lights are, and so on, you basically get um, all of these multiple reflections of the light coming back down from the sky. And so what, what happens is when we're looking up into the sky, it looks like the light is coming from up there in the sky, but in fact, it's just a reflection. It's, it's really kind of like a mirage situation, except it's caused by extreme cold instead of extreme heat. So great, great images, uh, Yasmina, thanks for that. And hopefully uh, Sebastian and Genevieve, you, 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 uh, from this picture, you can sort of figure out how, uh, how these are formed. 
even though they look like Northern Lights, Northern Lights very, very different. And we will be talking about those a little bit tonight as well because there were some great Northern Lights. Okay, let's move on here. Before we move on to our um, featured presentation, let's duck over to the um, Polar Bear International live Northern Lights camera. This is a camera right now in Churchill, pointed up at the sky. And I don't know if you can see, but basically right up at the top of the screen there is the constellation Gemini. Uh, the, uh, the, two, the head of the twins is, is sort of the two bright stars right in the center uh, top of the frame. And this is the view of the Northern Lights from Churchill right now. You can go to explore.org and check this out anytime. This is, this is how I do a lot of my Northern Lights watching right now because it's much warmer here than it would be out in Churchill. But there is activity going on now. There is some uh, solar activity that's sort of hit the earth over the last couple of days, been giving us some really, really interesting, excuse me, some really, really interesting uh, sunspots to look at, but also some really good aurora. Now, the aurora was pretty good down in the southern part of Manitoba last night, apparently. Um, I'm not sure tonight if it's going to reach this far down. Churchill is sort of far enough north that they're always going to have northern lights, it seems. They're just perfectly situated. It's like the northern lights capital of Canada. So if you really want to see the northern lights, take a, take a trip up there and, and visit because it's, uh, it's the place to be. We'll talk a little bit more about the sun as we go along here. Let me just see. We got some questions here. Uh, oh, lots of people commenting on the audio and stuff like that. Shelly was asking um, back about um, the ice crystals, I guess, here. We're talking a little bit about the, the sun pillars, and they were asking if that's what causes sun dogs as well. And actually, uh, Ulrich asked uh, the same question. It's a similar kind of thing, except it's a different shape of ice crystal. Um, the ones in our sun pillars, or our, pardon me, our light pillars like this, or sun pillars, I guess, are very, very flat, like sheets of, uh, of ice crystals. The ones that make sun dogs are more, um, they're thicker, and so they have uh, some thickness to them, and so they're still oriented. They all line up and, and um, stay nice and flat, but they ref can refract and reflect the sun sideways as well. And, that, and that's why you get those uh, sun dogs on either side of the sun with a sort of a rainbow kind of thing, because the the light actually goes through the crystal, and when it goes through the crystal, it actually breaks up into its rainbow of colors. So, it, uh, sun dogs are a little bit closer to a rainbow, but um, these light pillars, um, it, it all has to do with ice in this case. So, all right, uh, let's move along here. We have a few. Uh, I have here someone, Baba123 says, you are awesome and smart. I wonder if that's my mom. Is that my mom? Come on. Uh, Baba, of course, Ukrainian for grandmother. That's what my kids call her. So I'm wondering if that's my mom. Um, Callie is uh, asking, why were Zodiac signs made? You know, we haven't talked about the Zodiac all that much. But um, the Zodiac constellations are the, the 12 ones that are printed in the newspaper every day along with advice on, you know, whether you can win the lottery or, or those kinds of things. They, they used to be used to try and predict the future, essentially. Um, nowadays, we don't spend too much time on that, but the constellations are real things. And so they will be, um, they will be up there in the sky. And they were picked for, for the constellations of the zodiac because those are the ones that the planets will actually move through. So... For example, I'm an Aquarius, um, and so my constellation is Aquarius. The idea is that the sun was in that constellation when I was born. It doesn't quite work out like that anymore, but planets will go through that constellation. You'll never see someone whose birth sign is the Big Dipper, because the Big Dipper is in a part of the sky that planets don't go to, and so nobody gets to be the Big Dipper for their zodiac constellation. Oh, okay. Um... Well, hi, Baba123. Um, I guess you're not my mom. Very good. Okay. Um, we are going to move to uh, our next section here. 
I want to bring up our Stellarium program, which is always a great thing to uh, take a look at. Let's us simulate the whole sky and give us a sense of what's up there. So I've got the sky sort of set for pretty much the current time right now. And if we zoom out a little bit here, we'll start over in the north. We've still got the Big Dipper. It's really starting to stand up on its handle over in the north. It's getting higher and higher. And that's really a mark of spring, as I've, as I've said before. If we move around more towards the east, that's where we've got, well, the east and the southeast, that's where we've got our, our um, winter constellations. Here's Gemini the Twins. In fact, this is, this is almost exactly the view that we had of the uh, Aurora Cam. There's Gemini the Twins right along in here. And then there was another star down here. This is Procyon one of the brighter stars in Canis Minor. And then of course, Orion is starting to move high into the south. Now low in the east, we have some constellations that we haven't talked about for a long time. The um, springtime constellations. We're just starting to see Cancer the Crab come up and Leo the Lion is just breaking the horizon over here. And we'll be talking more about those, of course, as we get closer into spring. But as soon as I can start seeing them in the sky, I know winter is coming to an end. You know, we just had Groundhog Day, sort of the midway point between the winter solstice in December 21st and the uh, spring equinox in March 21st or so. And so we really are on the, on the downhill side of winter and coming in towards better weather, I hope. In the south, Orion, Taurus the Bull, the Pleiades star cluster, the winter sky is just full of beautiful, bright stars. We spent a lot of time looking at some of the objects you can see in there uh, last week, and we'll be delving into some of these constellations again and looking at a few more objects with binoculars and telescopes in the coming weeks. We'll get a chance. My favorite time to see Orion is actually, you know, late February into March. Maybe the weather won't be so as so bad and it will be nice and high in the sky early so that's what I'm kind of looking forward to but I have been ducking outside to say hi to Orion uh, even in the uh, minus 40 temperatures that we've been having. Way off in the southwest there's a really really bright thing over here. Wait a minute this is set for the wrong date. So no, no we're good. We're starting to have a crescent moon has appeared and it's almost setting right now. It, it, it doesn't stay um, above the horizon very long after sunset before it disappears. So we're still in sort of the dark of the moon period that we were talking about last week because the moon sets pretty soon after sunset and then it's out of the sky for the whole rest of the night. So you've got a nice dark sky to, to go and observe in. If you got out really early, you might've still caught Jupiter low in the Southeast or southwest, pardon me, after sunset. But that's the only planet that you will really see until you get to the morning sky. We're actually just going to pop over to the morning sky. Right now, we're going to go to, oh, let's say, six in the morning. And we will look over here in the southeast. And starting, you know, about six in the morning, that's when Venus starts to come up. And here we're showing it as a, a big bright object because it is so much brighter than any of the stars. It's just, it doesn't look natural. It doesn't look like a normal star kind of object. It looks like it must be something else because it is so bright. And right now it's at its almost its peak brightness. The other evening or the other inner planets that we're going to be talking about are actually all in that part of the sky. But the thing is, they're quite low, and by the time they start rising up, the sky has already started brightening. So there's a very, very narrow window that you might be able to go outside and still see some of the, um, these other planets. So here we have Venus. Down and to the right, this is Mars. Hardly noticeable, really. And then way down here, probably impossible to see, unless you have perfect conditions, is the planet Mercury. So we, right here, we have the four inner planets. We've got Mercury, Venus, Earth, where we're standing, and Mars. 
and that will uh, lead us into uh, our feature for this evening. So let me just get us switched over and we will take a look at the inner planets. Let me just see if we had any questions on the um, on the uh, Stellarium portion here. Oh, I see we have a couple here. Uh, Philip is asking, what causes the zodiacal light? So the zodiacal light is a thing that happens around this time of the year, and uh, it's visible for a couple of weeks when the, the moon is out of the sky. It's a very faint glow that comes out of the um, out of the sunset area and kind of looks like a almost like a haystack shape that of, of a very very faint glow now if you're in the city you won't see it you really have to be under really dark skies to see it it's basically light being scattered by dust in our solar system we've got the the sun and the planets but there's dust scattered all in there and at the around this time it is the perfect time for um, that very very faint glow to be visible just after sunset it's a, a fairly rare thing to see i haven't seen it very often probably three or four times um and always from really really dark skies so maybe we'll talk more about that in a in a future episode because there's a there's a bunch of neat things to do with that um okay lots of uh, uh hey everybody nice to see uh, the folks that have joined us great and happy birthday linda Yesterday, Groundhog Day, 70 trips around the sun. Congratulations. That's a milestone. Good for you. I uh, hope you had a great birthday. Oh, by the way, uh, Melissa, I'm having the supernova tea tonight. It is, it is quite lovely. Okay. Um, our feature, the inner planets. Now, you'll notice that, first of all, there are more inner planets than I mentioned. I'm including the inner dwarf planet. There, is, there, are, there are five dwarf planets in our solar system and eight major planets. One of those dwarf planets is in with the inner planet, so I'm in, including it. And so from the left here, we've got Mercury, Venus, Earth with its moon, Mars with its two moons, although its two moons are so small that you can't see them. Uh, they actually are in there somewhere, but you just can't see them at this scale. And then the asteroid or the dwarf planet Ceres on the far right there. This is our, you know, our solar system, kind of. I mean, obviously, they're not really all that close together. But this is a rough relative scale of uh, the various planets. And the inner solar system is really those four inner planets plus the asteroid belt. Because those four planets are roughly the same size. They're made out of roughly the same things. I mean, there's lots of differences. But they're, they're kind of similar. We can, we can imagine... Um, you know, them being in the same category. They certainly don't fit in the same category as the, the outer planets, Jupiter or Saturn or things like that, because they're just completely different. Different scale, different composition, different everything, really. But the four of them kind of fit together. So let's take a look at these four inner planets, particularly because they're, they're all gathering in the morning sky. But what, what can we look for for these planets? Okay, the first one, Mercury. Mercury is the hardest planet to see, especially now that Pluto has been demoted to dwarf planet. Mercury is for sure the hardest planet to see. Not because it's small. I mean, it's small, but it's not that far away from us. It's because it's very close to the sun. As it orbits the sun, it doesn't get very far on either side of the sun from our point of view. So that means we can only ever see it just before the sun rises and just after the sun sets. The sun has to be below the horizon so that it's starting to get dark, but Mercury has to still be above the horizon. And of course, as it goes around, sometimes it's just too close to the sun for us to see. Usually three or four times a year, it swings out on one side or the other, and we have what's called an elongation, and that gives us an opportunity to see it. But not every elongation is um, the same. The one we had back in November, that's this one here, uh, had uh, Mercury just perfectly placed in the gap between my neighbor's garage and my other neighbor's across the lane, their tree. And so there's the moon up at the top and just a little dot for, for Mercury down near the bottom of the frame. That's pretty much what Mercury will look like. It's usually in a bright sky and it looks just like a little dot. Now we actually know quite a bit about Mercury. We've been sending uh, spacecraft there. Uh, 
Um, back in the 70s, the Mariner 10 spacecraft went flying by. It's actually hard to send things to the inner planets like Mercury and Venus, because it, if you're off by a little bit, you'll, you're getting close to the sun, and the sun's gravity is pretty powerful. So you really have to be a, quite crafty to be able to go to a, uh, an inner planet like Mercury or Venus and then enter orbit. So the first one was a flyby. It just went by in a line and then went off into orbit around the sun. And so it, it took pictures as it went whizzing past. And this was kind of the view. In the old days, they literally put these individual photographs down on a big map and then taped them all down and then took a photograph from above. And that's how they got this, this kind of mosaic. Nowadays, of course, you Photoshop it and it looks way better. So this is still the Mariner 10 data, but with modern, uh, modern things together. But it, we only saw half of the planet because the other half was dark at the time and, and we couldn't hang around. We just went flying past. Well, since then, the Messenger spacecraft went there. Very uh, sophisticated spacecraft, has a big heat shield on it, and it was able to go into orbit. It took a long time to get there. It flew past many other planets to use their gravity to slow down enough so that when it got to Mercury, it could actually enter orbit. Spent a few years in orbit and basically mapped the entire planet. So we now know, basically, Mercury is a big, gray, lifeless rock in space. Very little atmosphere. There is technically an atmosphere of sodium atoms, but that's not really, it's not really enough to be like a, a blanket of air or anything like that. So basically, there's pretty much no atmosphere. That means that the, the sun that hits the sunlit side heats up that side of the, of the planet very, very intense, probably 400 degrees or so. But as soon as the planet spins around so that that side is on the night side and the sun's not shining it there anymore, all of that heat from the rocks just radiates back out into space. There's no blanket of air to keep it in. And the temperature on the, the dark side of Mercury goes down below 100 degrees every night. So, you know, we, we sort of get the idea that, oh, the closest planet to the sun, it's going to be very, very hot. Well, only in the daytime. At night, freezing cold. Now, interestingly, right at the poles of Mercury, there are some craters there where the temperature might be um, not as extreme. And in fact, there's probably places there where the sun doesn't get to. Some of the craters are deep enough that they're always in shadow. And it's, it's been detected that there is some water ice in those craters. Kind of amazing. Even on this planet where the temperature goes up so high, there's still permanent ice caps on the, uh, on the surface of the planet. Messenger also didn't just take pictures, but did all sorts of uh, spectroscopy readings, measuring the composition, basically, of what the rocks are. So we know a huge amount about Mercury. And actually, the data um, is still being analyzed. It's been, you know, a number of years since it, it came back and they're still figuring out and, and, and mining through that data and learning more and more about the planet Mercury. This is a very colorful image, but if you were standing there, it wouldn't look like that. It would look more like this. It, Mercury really does look like the moon, just battered with craters, gray, no mountains though, like the moon has, no big gray areas like the seas or the, the Maria as they're called. It's just rock and crater. It, it looks really like a really big asteroid. Okay, planet number two, Venus. Venus is named after the goddess of love and beauty. It is a wonderful object to see in the sky. It is also closer to the sun than we are. So it's always in the same direction as the sun generally, but it gets a little farther on either side. And that means that we can often see it in a darker sky. That coupled with the fact that Venus is extremely bright makes it the evening star or the morning star in most cases. It's, it'll be the first star that you see at night as it gets dark if it's visible in the evening sky. And it'll be the last star that you see before sunrise in the morning like we have it right now. Through a telescope, Venus doesn't show us anything through its clouds. It's totally covered with white clouds with almost no detail visible. But it does show phases like the moon. The two inner planets closer to the sun, Mercury and Venus, both have phases. And right now, actually, uh, the planet Venus in the morning sky is uh, a very thin crescent. 
even with a really powerful pair of binoculars, like, uh, like the 15 by 70s or the, the 20 by 80s that uh, a few of you have out there, you should be able to spot the fact that Venus is a tiny little fingernail clipping uh, crescent. And uh, there are even a few people that are able to see that with, its, with their unaided eye. It's right at its, its sort of biggest point right now. So now's the time to see how good your vision is. If you can actually see Venus as a crescent with your eyes, I'd like to hear from you because I've only seen, I've only met one person who can do it so far. So this is really what Venus looks like. It's these sort of uh, white and little bit of butterscotch cloud to them. And we could not see through these clouds. There's never any clear spots. So we could never see the surface of Venus. Now we kind of assumed that it was a, a rocky planet underneath the clouds. It wasn't big enough to be like Jupiter where it's just clouds all the way in. Um, there wouldn't be enough gravity to, to hold that together. So there must have been some rocks down there, but we had no idea what the surface was like. And so in the absence of that, of any information, people would imagine what Venus would be like. Well, is it going to be, it's closer to the sun, so it must be warmer than Earth, right? Well, what kind of places on Earth are cloudy? Mm, well, rainforests are cloudy. Yeah, maybe it's a rainforest on Venus. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe dinosaurs live there. I don't know where the dinosaur speculation came from, but seriously, up to about the 50s, the, the books would basically say, Venus may be inhabited and it may have vegetation and it may have all of this stuff. They had no idea of knowing. But science fiction always fills in the, the gaps in science fact, right? Then we decided to start building rockets and sending spacecraft to the planets. And the Soviet Union actually started exploring Venus first. Um, they sent the Venera space probes and, uh, the first couple of Veneras didn't really get off the ground as they were working out the, the bugs of the rockets. But one of the Veneras finally launched properly and headed off, took, I don't know, six or eight months to get there, went down into the clouds. And the plan was it would pop out a parachute and it would float down and it would, you know, radio back pictures and all that kind of stuff. Went into the clouds. We never heard from it again. So build another one and you send it along and it went into the clouds. We never heard from it again. Several space probes later, they realized that some of the problems were unanticipated. For example, the clouds that look all nice and white and butterscotchy are made of concentrated sulfuric acid, which is very bad on things like parachutes. So probably those early spacecraft just pancaked into the ground because their parachute lines dissolved through. They also learned that the uh, temperature of the atmosphere down at the surface is actually about uh, close to 500 degrees Celsius. It's even hotter than Mercury. The clouds are like a, a big blanket trapping the heat in uh, basically the greenhouse effect, if you've heard of that, where the, you know, the, the heat goes in and then the clouds prevent the heat from getting out and it builds up the heat, just like in a greenhouse. Well, on Venus, the greenhouse effect is out of control due to the sulfur dioxide and the carbon dioxide and all the different gases in the atmosphere. Lots of, there's water vapor and everything. So that was really bad. It also turns out that the clouds are so thick and heavy that there's more pressure at the surface of Venus than there is at the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. And so some of the spacecraft would have been just squished like a tin can. So I guess Venera 8 actually landed and survived for, I think it was 42 minutes. And um, it was a little spacecraft like this. They finally realized we can't make a nice, beautiful looking spacecraft. We have to make something that looks like a cannonball with a, with a couple of legs and things like that. And it took this picture of the surface of Venus. It sent back one picture before it died. A couple of other Venera spacecraft lasted long enough to send back a couple of pictures. I think we have a half dozen pictures from the surface of Venus for 10 years worth of sending spacecraft to, to get there. Venus is a nasty planet. I just saw Tiffany uh, posted the, uh, the Bermuda planet. Yeah, it's like the Bermuda Triangle kind of situation for sure. Um, and Jenny said, yeah, the dinosaurs got them. Yeah, exactly. It would, it would be awesome if we had found vegetation or any kind of life on Venus. But 
the surface of Venus is probably the most inhospitable place of all. Up until last year, I would have said, I don't know where we might find life in the solar system, but I know where we will not find it, and we will not find it on Venus. That was up to about last year. And I'm still pretty sure we're not going to find life on the surface of Venus. It turns out, though, that in the clouds, you know, as, as you get, go from the surface of the Earth and you go higher up into the mountains and then up into the atmosphere, it gets colder and colder and colder. Well, same thing on Venus. And there's a sweet spot at some point where you get up high enough into the atmosphere that you're midway between the 500 degrees of, of the surface and the minus 200 degrees of outer space. And you can get to a point where there could be moderate temperatures. And they have theorized that there could actually be acid-eating bacteria floating in the clouds of Venus. And not only have they theorized this, there are even some observations indicating that there are a couple of gases that are being produced in the clouds of Venus that can only be produced, on Earth at least, can only be produced either by life or in a laboratory. They, they don't occur naturally. They can only be produced either by the biological processes of life or in a laboratory environment. So that's really intriguing. I mean, I would love to have been totally wrong about life on Venus. We'll have to see what happens. Um, it'll take a little while before we can, you know, refine our, our technology and develop the next mission to go there. And rather than trying to land on the, on the surface, I guess we should have just stayed up in the clouds in the first place. It would have been easier. And uh, that's where all the action is. Uh, okay, uh, I saw a question go by here. Uh, Mercury was asking, um, sorry, Boris was asking, how long is Mercury's day and year? So Mercury takes 88 days to go around the sun. So its year is basically 88 Earth days. So 88 times 24 hours is basically all it takes to go around the sun, pretty fast. The planet itself though, rotates kind of locked in with that. And so I think it's daytime is like 60 some days. So if you were standing in one spot on Mercury, you would see a sunrise and then about 30 some days later, it would be a sunset and then you'd have a 30 day, 30 Earth day long night. So very, very different calendar than what we'd be used to here. Uh, let's see. Oh, James is just reporting, yeah, Venus shows as a spectacular thin crescent in 20 by 80 binoculars. Um, yeah, the, uh, I've got 15 by 70s and I hope to, uh, well, we'll see what tomorrow morning's sky looks like, but I hope to get a chance to see the crescent. I've seen a few people reporting in the, uh, on the local astronomy club's forum that uh, they're spotting the crescent very nice. Ulrich says, yeah, lots of birthdays on Mercury. Yeah, we'd all, we'd all be many, many, many years older than we are here on the Earth. And speaking of the Earth, this is the most unique planet in the solar system for many, many reasons. Obviously life. It's the only planet that we know for sure that has life on it now. It's the only planet we know that's ever had life on it for sure. Um, it's got a very dense atmosphere, but not as dense as Venus's. So it's, it's perfectly set up for, for the kind of organism that we are, of course. Um, and in fact, the atmosphere was partly created by life. The, the amount of oxygen in our atmosphere couldn't be explained through normal chemistry. It's because we have trees taking carbon dioxide and converting that into oxygen. And so if we were to send a robot probe to this blue planet, we'd be able to tell by measuring its atmosphere that there was life on it. Plus, actually, if you just came in from the night side, you would see all the city lights. So it would be pretty obvious. But even from a very far distance, you could tell that the planet has at least some kind of plant life or something on it because of the amount of oxygen. That's what James Webb is going to do with all those planets out there. It's going to look for that sign of signs of oxygen to see, you know, if they match the, the normal levels or if it can only be explained by life. That's still not proof, but it's one of those situations where Either it's life or it's something we don't even know about yet. Either way, it's a pretty cool discovery. Okay. Um, 
the, the big thing about Earth is its atmosphere, and its atmosphere has a huge effect on us uh, as astronomers, not only because we breathe it, but the whole weather and cloud thing really defines what we can see from the surface. And it really defines um, what kinds of astronomy you can do from the surface. I mean, basically, the atmosphere is very transparent at the wavelengths that you and I can see with our eyes. That's not a coincidence. I mean, basically, the one leads to the other. But it does block out some of the other kinds of things, like ultraviolet, for example. The atmosphere blocks out some of the ultraviolet um, rays. And so if you want to do good ultraviolet astronomy, looking at, at uh, objects that give off that ultraviolet light, you need to go up onto a mountain where the air is thinner, or you need to go up in an airplane, or you need to go up into space with a satellite. But the atmosphere, incredibly complicated. The idea that we can predict at all what this massive amount of molecules is going to do at any time in the future with any accuracy just constantly boggles my mind. It's amazing that we can predict what things are going to be like tomorrow with this complicated system that we live in. So I know people are often like, oh, the weather guy's always wrong. They're doing the most complicated job in the universe at this point. So cut them some slack. Okay. Um, the other thing about our planet, the moon. We are very unusual. We have one moon. We are the only um, planet to have, <coughs> excuse me, one moon. <coughs> Sorry about that. And our moon is very big compared to our planet. In fact, with the exception of Pluto, which has kind of always been a, a weird thing, the moon is the biggest moon compared to its planet of all. Um, most of the other ones, the planet is way, way bigger than the moons are here. We're pretty close. And that's really, really rare, really unusual, and key to the fact that we can live here. A big moon like that makes big tides. And the tides are probably what allowed life to go from oceans onto land with sort of a transition zone where those tides are sort of like it's it's wet for some of the time and then it's dry for some of the time. You've got that, that sort of area where you can spend some time and evolve so that you can live in other areas. Critical for the development of life. We'll have to see if it's, um, if it's required that life needs that kind of situation or if there are other situations out there that can also result in life. Hopefully, we'll know the answer to that. Um, and our final inner planet, finer, major inner planet, the planet Mars. This is, uh, this is a great shot from the Alamal um, spacecraft, or the HOPE spacecraft from the United Arab Emirates. I finally was able to find some of the images that have been released beyond those first early ones that we were looking at last summer. And uh, they've got some beautiful, beautiful images. We call Mars the red planet, but you know, it really isn't. It's only red if you're down on the surface looking down at the ground. It's got lots of clouds, white clouds, it's got white ice caps, um, the sky gets kind of bluish. It's really not that different from our planet. And here's, um, this is from the, uh, the Chinese rover that landed last summer as well. Um, it's looking at its own parachute and, um, and heat shield that uh, landed over there. Um, on the surface it is a big desert world. And so it's, it, it's red colored, and so it appears reddish in the sky. The thing about Mars, though, in the sky is that it really varies a lot from its best to its worst. Like Venus, it's right now at its brightest, but even at its faintest, it's still really bright. Jupiter and Saturn, they get a little brighter or a little fainter depending on where they are in the sky, but they don't change a whole lot. Mars goes from the brightest thing in the sky to I probably won't even notice it unless I'm looking for it. It really varies a lot because it, it is a close planet to us, but it's farther from the sun. So it could be all the way on the other side of the sun and really, really far away. Or it could be perfectly lined up with us so we're at our closest. Through a telescope, this was the view last, uh, this was the view in November of 2020 when it was last at its um, sort of close point to us. And 
This was through my backyard telescope with a little uh, video camera that I spent some time learning how to use. You can see the polar cap at the top and uh, some clouds along the bottom and the left edge. There's the red areas that are all um, visible and then the darker areas are basically darker areas of rock and so on. Um, when it's at its best, Mars is one of those drop everything and observe it with your telescope kind of objects. And in fact, when it was at its best last time, I went out every clear night and tried to take pictures um, to, to get as much out of it as I could. The rest of the time, it's hardly worth looking at. It's so small because it's so far away that it's maybe, I don't know, a fifth this size, maybe a, an eighth of this size. It's just a tiny little dot. So you can barely see anything on it. So right now, even if you could see Mars, it is not at all impressive. Um, and it won't really get impressive until later on towards the end of this year, where it starts getting closer to us again, and we'll have another opportunity to see that. Every 26 months or so, we have a Mars uh, opposition, where it's sort of at its best for us. So I'm looking forward to that at the end of the, uh, end of the um, year, hopefully. So uh, let's see. Oh, lots of questions here. Um, Let's see. Oh yeah, Na talking about the name of the moons. Um, Rhiannon has a question about telescopes, and I'll get to that uh, right at the end. I'll hold on to that one if you don't mind. Um, our moon doesn't have a name. Yeah, it, because it was the only one. It was the moon, or some, you know, in Latin it's Luna. Um, Selene, I think, is Greek. Um, but basically they all just mean moon. Um, it's like the Earth. You know, we, we could have just called it the planet because at the time we only knew of the one. But nowadays, I think uh, it's just too much of a hassle to change it. I mean, there was a move to try and call it Luna for a while, just so that it would be clear that it was not a moon of another planet or whatever, but just never caught on. Uh, let me see, we have another question here about, why is Mars always the go-to for other life forms? Is it because it's the most Earth-like world, or does this go back to novels and previous radio shows? Great question, Melissa. Yeah, you know, it's always Martians, right? It's never Venusians or Jovians or Saturnians. It's always Martians. I think it's partly because the word Martian is easy to say, but it is also Mars is the closest planet to us in terms of the life-giving um, elements that are needed. There used to be water on Mars, for sure. We don't know if it was there long enough for life to develop, but there's, there used to be water. Venus, if it had water on it, it all boiled into the atmosphere really, really early, so it probably wouldn't have um, had time for life to develop there necessarily. Now, maybe that's just our biases. We, we sort of think that, well, of course, life would like an environment like we like. Maybe not. But Mars definitely has had that. Even back to early, early days, um, I think because it's red in the sky. You know, Venus is this beautiful white uh, jewel up against the sunset colors, and it's, it's beautiful. Mars is this angry orange star opposite the, the sun in the sky, and um, it just looks evil, I guess, as compared to Venus. I think that's where a lot of it comes from. It really is just that color. Um, there's, uh, let me see, um, how far does space go? It goes all the way. It just keeps on going. We don't know for sure if there's an end to space, but you know what? It's, uh, it's probably moot because if there is an end, it's so far away that we'll never get there anyway. I think the universe goes on way, way farther than we can even observe. Um, Serge is asking, why are the inner planets rocky versus the outer gaseous giants? We used to think that's because that's how planets are made. You have a big spinning material of, of, of gas and the heavy stuff like rocks fall under gravity closer to the sun. And then the uh, lighter stuff gets blown out from the solar wind and gets pushed to the outside. And that's where all the gas planets form. That's what we used to think when our solar system was the only one. Now we realize planets do not stay 
where they are formed. They migrate, they move around, solar systems change uh, over time. And the early days of, of the solar system, our planets were not where they are now. Um, and there was a, a bunch of motion. So to be honest, we really don't know exactly why that is the case. We only know that our solar system looks like that right now and has looked like that for, what, 10,000 years out of the four and a half billion years of its existence. We really are, are learning more about our own lack of knowledge as we learn more about the sky, I think. So we really don't know the, uh, the answer. Oh, hey, Abdul. Um, I unfortunately don't know why, but yeah, we can't post pictures to either of the things. If you go to my Scott the Sky Watcher page on Facebook, you can post it there though, and then I can share it from there. Um, okay, let me uh, move on here. Mars has two moons. Well, kind of. Mars doesn't really have any moons, but once a long time ago, a couple of asteroids got too close to it and Mars's gravity has grabbed them. Um, and we, we know that that's the case, first of all, because these things are small. Um, the biggest one, Phobos, is 27 kilometers by 22 kilometers by 18 kilometers. It's basically a big potato. Um, and then Deimos is even smaller than that. Very, very tiny. Um, and they're in weird orbits. Deimos will be there for a while, but Phobos is actually spiraling in and will crash into Mars. We only see it as a moon now because we happen to invent telescopes at this point in its history. So um, basically transient moons, I guess, is, uh, is what they are for Mars. And because just out past Mars is the asteroid belt, it makes sense. There's lots of asteroids around in that area. What's kind of cool is that you can see those moons in a telescope if you are very, very careful. Mars is quite bright when it's close to us, and its moons are quite faint. They're about as faint as the planet Pluto is through a telescope. Maybe not quite that faint, a little bit brighter than that, but still very, very faint, and they're right next to something really, really bright. So you have to figure out a way to block out the brightness of Mars and allow the light from Phobos and Deimos to come out. It's a, it's a complicated thing, but it is something that you can do. We'll try and cover it in detail before Mars comes to its best later on this year. Um, but there are ways to do that. And that's a, that's a very challenging telescopic observation. Here is the dwarf planet Ceres, much smaller than everything else. It's less than a thousand kilometers across. So, you know, uh, almost a quarter the size of our moon. It's uh, really, really tiny compared to, you know, major planets, hence the name dwarf planet. It's just big enough to be, um, I would say, uh, it's just big enough to have enough gravity to make itself mostly round. And that's one of the definitions of a dwarf planet. It's big enough so that gravity has pulled it into a round shape. Gravity likes round. If something is shaped like a potato, if it's big enough, it will actually shift itself and squish down into a round kind of shape. If it's not big enough, it'll stay potato shaped. So we see things like Phobos, a big, uh, you know, a potato shaped moon, that's really, really tiny. It's not big enough to pull itself into a, a round shape. I think we mentioned um, last week that the planet, the dwarf planet Ceres is visible in binoculars this week, right next to the Seven Sisters star cluster. And so there's a chart on our Manitoba Museum's webpage uh, under the planetarium section under current night sky that will help you track it down. And there's also a printer friendly version so you can print it out and take it with you and not have to kill your, your color printer cartridge to, uh, to do that. I'd love to see anybody that uh, gets a chance to track down Ceres. It, it generally means going out one night, drawing the stars that you can see in sort of that area of the sky, and then going out a couple nights later whenever it's clear and looking at the same area and finding which star moved, because Ceres is so small that it just looks like a tiny little dot amongst a sea of other dots. And to tell which one it is, you really have to see its motion. But that's kind of a cool thing to, uh, to try. Okay, uh, wow, there are lots of questions. We're gonna try and get to some uh, uh, in just a moment, but first it is time. Cool Space Stuff! 
All right. Uh, Perseverance, the rover on Mars, has done some pretty interesting work in the last little while. It's been taking rock samples that are getting that are going to be stored until it can be brought back um, by another mission that'll go and pick them up. So we've got these wonderfully um, collected rock samples, but we also have uh, indications of the potential for life. Now, not, we haven't found life on Mars. We have not found life on Mars. What we have found is that, again, kind of like the Venus situation, we found some chemistry that on the Earth is only created by life. It's only created by the processes of life. And on uh, Mars, we're finding those chemical results that are in the range that are much higher than you would expect normally. Uh, this has to do with the, the different types of carbon that they're finding in the rock samples. But really, really interesting. I mean, I kept going back and forth and wondering, you know, was there life on Mars? I'm sure there's nothing living there now, unless it's underground. I'm pretty sure that there wasn't anything big there, but we might find bacteria or something like that. I mean, just the fact that there would be something out there beyond the Earth would be huge to know. Um, so Perseverance is doing that. Ingenuity is still flying. There was a great picture on the NASA website a couple of days ago of uh, the rover took a picture of the, the helicopter and its, its solar panel on the top is all covered with dust and things like that. I guess when it landed, it kicked up dust and made a, made a bit of a mess on its solar panel. But uh, so th those guys are still working 10 months or so after all of this. In fact, uh, yeah, that is... Uh, a great mission that is still ongoing. The solar activity um, has been sparking some northern lights. Lots of sunspots going on. These sunspots on the top right here, number 2936, that group there was really, really big a few days ago and it's already started to shrink away. But when it was pointed right at the earth, a big burst of material came from the sun and that's what caused our northern lights the last few days. So, of course, you can't easily look at the sun unless you have very special filters, but you can um, take a look on a site like spaceweather.com and they have updating pictures that show you what's going on in the sun. Keep your eyes open for northern lights. I know central uh, and southern Manitoba are pretty much socked in tonight cloud-wise, but hopefully we'll get some clear skies in the next day or so. This was kind of a neat story. Um, a new asteroid was discovered, which is only the second kind, the second of its kind known. It's called an Earth Trojan ast asteroid. This picture here shows the Lagrange points. And we talked about Lagrange points when we were talking about the Webb Space Telescope. You got the sun in the middle, you got, oops, uh, you've got the Earth, and then you've got some points where the gravity of the sun and the Earth sort of help counterbalance each other. So L1 is between us and the sun, and that's where the solar satellites sit. Um, L2 is where the James Webb Space Telescope will, will orbit, and it's, it's on the far side of the Earth. L3 is on the far side of the Sun from us. We don't tend to use that one very much because you really can't talk to a spacecraft if the Sun is right in the way. Um, then there are these ones, L4 and L5, kind of like out on the wings there. If an object is in those spots, it will basically orbit the Sun but it will stay kind of the same distance from the Earth all the time. So basically, as the Earth rotates around the, its circle, the L4 and the L5 will all move along with it. And so you basically have um, an area that will, will um, stay stable related to the Earth. Now for Jupiter, Jupiter has a cloud of asteroids at its L4 and L5 points, and they're called Trojan asteroids for some reason. I'm not sure. I'm... I guess they were running out of mythological names or whatever. It, it has nothing to do with, you know, building wooden horses and sneaking through gates or anything like that. But the Trojan asteroids, Jupiter has lots. Saturn has quite a few. Um, Uranus and Neptune, they've got a handful. Earth only had one. Well, now we have two. And the cool thing about these Trojan asteroids, because they're at the same distance all the time, they're pretty easy to get to if you wanted to send a spacecraft there and back. 
Whereas the other asteroids that are orbiting around the sun, you have to wait till they line up and then you send your spacecraft and then you have to wait for the orbits to keep going around and around until they line up again. Well, these Trojan asteroids, it's like they're just parked there. They're always at the same distance. So they're talking about uh, potential missions to asteroids to learn more about them and using these Trojan asteroids. Our last uh, story, um, S SpaceX has been launching a whole bunch of stuff. They've had, I think, six launches already this year, something like that. Well, one launched earlier today, and it's a bunch of those Starlink satellites where they put up like 50 satellites that will eventually spread out. Well, for Manitobans, southern Manitobans, we can see them tomorrow morning, uh, beginning uh, just before 6 a.m., and it's close enough to the launch time that they should be still very close together, like little pearls on a string. It only takes a few days for them to start spreading out and eventually they just spread out and then you, you know, they just you know, go across the sky every 10 or 15 seconds or something and that's not very interesting. But in these first little while where, where it's still, excuse me, where it's still um, close, it's a beautiful sight. So tomorrow morning, just before six, look off in the southeast and see if you can spot those. Um, we had a great uh, question about telescopes. Um, the answer to what's the best telescope is a complicated one. It's like asking what's the best car or what's the best color. It really depends a little bit on you and a little bit on your budget and a little bit on what you want to do. However, I do have some great uh, resources on my Scott the Skywatcher page, which is on Facebook. Um, Facebook.com slash Scott, Scott the Skywatcher. I've also got some stuff on binoculars there that just went up today, and I'll be adding uh, new content there as well. So if you want to take a look there, you can also drop me a line, and I'd be happy to, uh, to answer some of your questions um, offline. Uh, and keep your eye on the Manitoba Museum's webpage. If you go there and you sign up for our e-news e newsletter, we don't spam you or anything like that, but you will find out when our set of astronomy courses uh, goes live. We're going to be running some uh, introductory and intermediate astronomy courses uh, over Zoom over the next uh, three months or so. So you can watch for those and uh, you can come and hang out with me and we'll talk telescopes. That's all the time we have for tonight. I went way over and I'm sure I'll get in a little bit of trouble, but we had lots of great questions today. And uh, so I'm glad we had a chance to chat. Um, let's uh, do this again next week. I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Next week, we will be talking about um, the Artemis mission to the moon. NASA is going back to the moon. There's a mission slated to launch towards the end of March that will be the first robotic test. And then after that, three Americans and one Canadian astronaut will go off to the moon. We're going to talk about the mission, what it means, what the Canadian contributions will be, and so on. That'll be our feature for next week. I hope you get some clear skies. I hope it's not too cold for you. Stay warm. Thanks very much, and we will see you all next week.